And hello, everybody. Welcome back here to the KSAM Sports Podcast, our third episode. But hopefully today we do not have to split it into two parts like we did last week. So should be a very great show. Got a lot to talk about today. We've got college baseball as the College World Series is wrapped up. We've got Major League Baseball. We have somehow not talked about one of the biggest moves in pro soccer history, and we'll talk about that as well, as a lot of uh, conference movement in the NCAA that is going to go into effect starting this weekend. I'm Carlos Zimmerman. I'll welcome now in my partner for the show, my man, my main squeeze, Jordan Smith. Jordan, how are you on this fine day? Not as tired as you, evidently. Yeah, um, <laughs> folks, I want to <laughs> preface something. Uh, before we started uh, recording this, uh, I've j- I yawned like nine times. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know why. I don't know if it's the lunch I had today, or if I'm just not getting enough sleep. Either way, the yawns are going to happen in this episode, and you folks are just got to deal with it. So let's get a yawn counter going. Yeah, in the comments. You, yeah, we can get a <laughs> yawn counter going. That 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 would be absolutely fantastic. So start it off. College World Series has officially come to an end. Thus wrapping up the 2022-2023 college or collegiate athletic season, as it always does every year. Jordan, quite the final between Florida and LSU. It was, but before I want to, before we get into that, I actually want to get into some breaking news That's right. out of the NFL world. There's a bu- apparently a bunch of players in the NFL that are fixing to get suspended for gambling violations. <laughs> including uh, uh, Indianapolis Colts cornerback and kick returner Isaiah Rodgers. Um, there's a few others. Um, Rodgers saying he takes full responsibility, apparently, on social media. This all, of course, is according to Adam Schefter of ESPN. Um, but, yeah, they're yeah, apparently they're having issues now with players gambling after uh, the whole Calvin Ridley situation. I, 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 what I, do, I, I just don't understand it because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, you're already making thousands, if not millions of dollars, and you want to go out and gamble while you are an active player, which you know it's it's a rule made by the N- by the NFL. It's it's a no no. So I just I don't I again like I, I said I don't really understand why these players feel the need that they have to do it, even though they're already making gobs and gobs of money. There in the report it says four Detroit Lions players and one Washington Commanders player was or were suspended by the NFL for gambling. Lions wide receiver Quintez Cephas, uh, safety CJ Moore were in, suspended indefinitely for betting on NFL games. Washington Commanders defensive end Shaka Tony was also indefinitely suspended. Uh, Lions wide receiver Jamison Williams and Stanley Berryhill are suspended for six games each for mobile betting. That occurred at apparently the Lions Allen Park facility, uh, and with some of these suspensions, the Lions then released Cephas Moore and Barry Hill after they were suspended for the gambling issues. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Now, now that I I've said that they can make gobs and gobs of money, then you say all those names, and I recognize maybe one of those names being Isaiah Rogers with right. the Colts, um, and the teams that they're involved with, the Lions and the Commanders, then maybe I see why they felt like they needed to gamble because... Even then. I know the the, the team's caliber is not quite there, so maybe they're not making enough or whatever, but or they're just doing it just to do it. So, so it, according to the official rule book, the six key rules of the gambling policy that the league officials are emphasizing and are going to reinforce because of all of these you know, continued issues after, like I said, last year's Calvin Calvin Ridley situation and now this year with six more players is, one, don't bet on the NFL. Two, don't gamble at your team facility while traveling for a road game or staying at a team hotel. Three, don't have someone bet for you, like what happened with the Alabama baseball head coach. Mm -hmm. Four, don't share team insider information to basically try to get an edge in the betting area. Five, don't enter a sports book during the NFL playing season. And six, don't play daily fantasy football. Yep. So that seems pretty pretty clear, obviously. It, the the one about don't enter a sports book during the NFL playing season is interesting because that basically means in the offseason you're allowed to enter a sports book. So I don't really 
understand that one too much, even though you're not technically allowed to bet on the NFL. I guess technically you could go bet on an NBA game. Yeah. According to that rule, I feel like that's what it's saying, but I, th- I, I think, don't know. I think the overall key ar- overarching factor here is don't bet on the NFL if you are an active player in the mm-hmm. NFL. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's just a safe move for NFL for any sport. I mean, we saw it with Pete Rose. That's why he's he's banned from baseball, even though he's been on multiple things with baseball. He's been in Cincinnati Red Stadium. He was a Fox Sports analyst for a time, if you remember that train mm-hmm, wreck. Mm-hmm. And the Cincinnati Reds now, of course, putting a sports betting facility in their ballpark, yep. which makes it all the much sweeter. It, it's the, the irony is cruel, <laughs> but also very, you know, yeah, great. It is. It is. So uh, just a little breaking news that literally we're about to start recording and it just it popped up on our ESPN feed. I'm like, all right, sure. I guess let's talk about this. Yeah, so, I guess uh, now going back to the whole the College World Series topic. I mean, what a tournament. Mm hmm. It was a fantastic, fantastic tournament. And a lot of people, uh, at least from things that I've read online, uh, especially a story from Ryan McGee on ESPN.com, a lot of people, a lot of the College World Series old-timers, if you will, are basically all asking the same question of, is this the best College World Series we've ever seen? That's it's, It's tough to think about that because, you know, you've had a lot of great you know, College World Series. Uh, mm-hmm. For me, the one that comes to my mind is 2010 uh, with Whit Merrifield getting the walk-off win mm-hmm. for South Carolina, and then that started the back-to-back years for the Gamecocks. So that was a great College World Series. I thought this year was great because I over, overall, I think across the landscape of the NCAA, there was so much parity mm-hmm. this year from football to basketball right, and into baseball. Right. As well, and I mean, you saw it with Oral Roberts making the College World Series for, not, not, oddly enough, not the first time, <laughs> their second time, but it had been their first since 1978. Right. But I mean, and you got other teams too, like TCU mm. overall had a great, great year. Your baseball blue bloods, if you will, Virginia, Florida, Wake, well, yeah, Wake, I would, I would argue Wake Forest because yeah. they, they've had success in the past, uh, LSU, Tennessee. Yeah, and LSU really getting back to the the top of the leaderboard, literally by winning it all. But returning to that that success that everybody knows them for uh, it, since the turn of the century of constantly making it to Omaha and constantly having opportunities to win national title after national title after national title, uh, and, and, and even here, if you want to look at some of the highlights of the College World Series, I got some for you. Eight games were decided by only. One run. It ties a mark that was reached only twice in 75 prior editions of the entire College World Series. Well, more than half of that came in the upper bracket with TCU Mm -hmm. and Oral Roberts, Virginia, and Florida. That entire first round in the loser's bracket, Oral Roberts beats TCU 6-5. Florida beats Virginia six to five. All right. TCU beats Virginia four to three in the losers bracket. Florida beats Oral Roberts five to four. Florida beats TCU three to two. Some other notes: three teams overcoming a deficit of three or more runs actually tied for the most since the men's college World Series moved to uh, to Charles Schwab in 2011. So that's something to know since they basically moved downtown. Uh, three home runs hit, or 30 home runs hit overall in the College World Series. Most since the 2010 tournament, which had 32, which is the year right before they moved the tournament downtown. Florida had 17 of the 30 home runs total, tying a record set by both this year's national champion in LSU and USC, both in the 1998 College World mm-hmm. Series. But wait, we're not done. We've got a few more. <laughs> We don't have four pages of it. We're fine. We only got three more highlights. Uh Uh-huh. Lucky number seven. Florida's Ty Evans hit five home runs in the College World Series by himself. He set a College World Series record, leaving behind 11 guys before him who had hit four, all having done their work as much of a hitter friend over at Rosenblatt Stadium before they moved it to Charles Schwab. Uh, Came to Omaha already having four all year and hit five in the College World Series. Those four came through 65 games of the entire season leading up 
to Omaha. Longest home run hit in the 12 games hosted this year at the new ballpark downtown was by actually by Wyatt Langford, 456 feet from home plate. And this is what helped the comeback for the Gators down three runs on the ninth to beat Virginia and avoid that loser's bracket altogether to get things going uh, in in the uh, start of the College World Series. And then the final note, probably the two best pitchers in all of college baseball this year and one of the better pitchers I think we've seen in a very long time. LSU's Paul Skeens and Wake Forest's Rhett Lauder set two school and one conference strikeout records in the same game. Hmm. A winner faces Florida semifinal match, which was one of the best baseball games I have ever watched in my entire life. Amazing ball game, extra innings, coming down to the wire. Uh, but, of course, that game being won, walk-off homer by Tommy Tanks, nice. as everybody calls him, blasting one first pitch going up against a relief pitcher and just not, absolutely demolishes one. Not just one. the reliever. Mm-hmm. That was Wake Forest's closer. Yeah, and, and the thing with that, too, is what's even better about that is a couple days before that, right after the game won, uh, my mic, I don't know what is happening in this mic. You got the bad headset. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. Um, but uh, apparently after the game won um, win for Wake Forest, he said in the post-game press conference, I don't think anybody can beat us. I mean, who can? I don't think anyone can. And that apparently caused the whole let's go beat them up from LSU, that, and they ended up doing it. That, that gives me <laughs> Matt Hasselback 2003 uh-huh. vibes. We're going to get the ball, and we're going to score. <laughs> Throws a pick. Right. So. Right. Um, but, yeah, so and it's apparently that walk-off in the 11th by Tommy Tanks is the first – OO game to enter extra frames, and they mentioned this on the broadcast since 1985, and only the second. Interesting note here: only the second since metal bats were introduced to the college game in 1974. So apparently, those suckers have been around for quite a while. Yes, <laughs> but yeah, that is. I mean, that that's just a few of the 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 highlights of everything that happened in Omaha, and kind of. Focusing in a little bit, looking at the the final between LSU and Florida, a good three game series. Obviously, it was the two best teams in the SEC pretty much all year. Um, but I don't know, like it was it was a good, very good first game. Second game, Florida demolishes LSU demolishes third game to win it all. And, I mean, you kind of look at some of the key notes for each game. Game one, 17 combined hits, one error between the two sides. 23 hits for Florida in game two, five errors defensively for LSU. And then game three victory for LSU, 24 hits for them in the entire game to help supplement the 18 runs that they scored in that one to win it. So, I don't know. I I feel like games two and three, while they were exciting, I feel like they were kind of a letdown, if you will, because I would have liked to see closer games, but... Granted, it doesn't matter. It was still a good series overall. I, I would argue, yeah, it was a great series overall. But as someone that experienced firsthand blowout ball games in college baseball this year, it, it, it's tough, especially in a final when you have those kind of lopsided games because everyone's like, Oh, it, I mean, that team's out of pit. LSU was just out of pitching that night. And I was like, all right, then what happened the next night then when they won it all? And then flip, you could flip the script for uh, Florida as well. Like, oh, yeah, after Florida beat LSU 24-4, to I was like, that's it. LSU broke their spirit, kind of like what Sam Houston did to Utah Valley. And then LSU was just channeled there inner self and what we knew they were capable of all year long and was able to get a big win in the championship. So th- there was talk about what, like, what is this one of the best college world series of all time overall? I would agree mm-hmm. in terms of the final. No, right? No, because I- I- I'm a big baseball fan, but I'm not a huge fan of open a can of, you know, whoop, you know what on, on, <laughs> on teams. Trying to be YouTube safe here. Yes. <laughs> we don't want to get demonetized. No. <laughs> so I thought it was, I thought it was a great college world series overall. Mm-hmm. 
Saw a lot of, you know, you know, we saw the team that I thought at the beginning of the year had the best shot to win the national championship with what they had on the team with Dylan Cruz being one of the biggest mashers in, right. in baseball and then Paul Skeens. Right. So I, I thought it was just great to watch overall. And I, I, I love that, that the, I said this last night when we were talking with all our buddies that, um, that I love that Sam Houston's going to be a very, very, very tiny footnote right. in LSU's run to a national championship, <laughs> beating us at the Carbach. Right. And then we were in their regional. Right. As well. So great year for college baseball. And I think the team that deserved to win it won it. Uh, yeah. And that's the thing. I feel like I, I didn't feel like Wake Forest, like we had kind of talked about last week. I didn't think they were going to win it. It wasn't that I didn't think they were the number one team, but I just felt like even though they had a very, very good squad, obviously as we saw in that nail-biting extra inning, fantastic ball game between them and LSU, as you kind of got closer to Omaha, it really felt like LSU had the upper hand over everybody in the nation. As you got through the regional and they swept through and – even looking through the super regional, you're like, maybe they're the ones that have it, and not the not the demons. I mean, you look at Wake Forest and their their run mm-hmm. to Omaha. I'm gonna pull up their regional, right, real quick. One second. Of course, it's at the top of this page. <laughs> um, oh, where the heck is it? You got it. Because they hosted, right? When was it? Yeah, Winston Salem. Mm-hmm. So they roll through their regional, right. Beat George Mason twelve to nothing. Beat Maryland twenty one to six. Beat George Mason again fifteen to one, and then rolled past Alabama. I would say rolled lightly because they only won that first game of the Super five to four. Right, and it wasn't convincing. Then they took the can to them and beat them twenty two to five to go to Omaha. Mm-hmm. But then you look at how they performed once they got to the College World Series. Right. They only beat Stanford three to two. They only beat LSU the first time three to two. So LSU had a little bit more time to get their offense going because they were able to shut out Tennessee five to nothing. And then I think Wake Forest at the end of the day just ran out of gas down the stretch. I think they used a lot of their offense in the regionals and the supers. And to be honest with you, looking at how they performed in the actual World Series in of itself, they probably should have lost one of those games. Right, right. They should not have been perfect going into the uh, semifinals. Yeah, probably not, honestly. So, I guess final note here before we head to our first break. Looking at not just Omaha, but the entire NCAA baseball tournament, who was kind of your your surprise team? I feel like the obvious answer is Oral Roberts for how far they got. Um, you could argue TCU. Even though they technically won the Big 12, they were the last team selected to the entire tournament. So them making it to uh, Omaha was impressive. Virginia making it as well was a tough stretch. Uh, One of the lower seeds in the entire tournament. But really, who was your surprise, I guess you'd be able the entire NCAA baseball tournament? Indiana State. Yeah? Even though they hosted uh, a regional at Terre Haute, and didn't unfortunately didn't get to host the super. Yeah. Um, I thought they were a pleasant surprise all year long because rarely do you ever hear of a Missouri Valley Conference team really making noise in baseball if your name is not Dallas Baptist. Right. Granted, that's going to change starting this weekend. We'll talk about that coming up later. Yeah. But Indiana State, pleasant surprise through the mm-hmm. entire thing, and they were one of my dark horse picks to make it to Omaha. The unfortunate thing is they had to run into a buzzsaw in TCU right. in the Supers. But I, I they were a pleasant surprise. You know, an, another one I would argue would be, you know, because I'm just looking at regional finals and teams that were able to make it there. You know, right. Campbell, the Fighting Camels, yeah. one of my favorite mascots of all time. <laughs> um, they were they were pleasant surprise. They were uh, right there in it till the thick of it until they ran into South Carolina. So they were interesting to see. Right. And if I were to pick my... Uh, Last one, Southern Miss. Okay. Out of the Sun Belt. You know, it's tough to drop into a loser's bracket in any kind of tournament. Mm-hmm. 
and they jumped down there from the gun, and losing to Samford in the first round. Right. They had to claw their way back. Had to beat Auburn, who got upset by Penn, who was another surprise in that region. Right. Then they went back and beat Samford, and then they took care of Penn to get to the Super Regional, beat Tennessee mm-hmm. in that first game. Yeah. But then Tennessee was able to overpower them down the stretch. So if there were there were some pleasant surprises, I would say outside of Oral Roberts, you know, Indiana State and Southern Miss were probably my big two. All right, we'll go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, we will talk a little bit about the MLB season halfway through, kind of give our first season awards and kind of look at what the second half has in store for us as well as we'll take a dip into the Biggest moment in MLS history, Lionel Messi, the best player in the world, signing with Miami and what that means for soccer in America. Back after this here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the KSAM Sports Podcast. <laughs> My name is Jordan Smith. Alongside me is Carlos Zimmerman. And let's dive into something that we really got to dive a lot into this last week, which is Major League Baseball. So we'll try not to spend an hour talking about it like we did last week, Carlos. But <laughs> but let's, let's kind of dive into it and, and see so far through this first half of the Major League season kind of what everything looks like right now, the landscape of baseball, and kind of what what we what we might or might not see from here. I mean, kind of looking at, I guess, really for me, the first midseason awards, if you will, uh, looking at biggest surprises and letdowns so far. I was kind of going back and forth between a couple teams, but probably my biggest surprise out of anybody in Major League Baseball right now. Probably the Texas Rangers, I'd have to say. Yes, they signed a lot of people. They spent a lot of money in the offseason. You figure that's going to have some kind of performance boost if you're going to spend that much money. I just did not see them sitting five games above the Angels at 48-31 and 31 at the halfway point of the MLB season here uh, towards the end of June. 25-14 and 14 at home. 23 and 17 on the road, a 61% win percentage. They 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 have it figured out somewhat. Yeah, they do. And you know, as much as it pains me as an Astros fan to give a Rangers team credit, I mean, I'll, I'll 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 give them the credit. Yeah. They're they 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 have got a really good squad put together even without their their main acquisition of the offseason uh not in there in Jacob DeGrom. So, I'll Give the credit where credit is due. They're in a really good spot right now. Can they keep that up? That is going to be the big question because what has been their Achilles heel, no pun intended, Mm -hmm. for the last few years has been the injury bug. It really has, and that's something that, like you said, we're going to kind of have to monitor and see what all of that is going to look like with the Texas Rangers. They're, They're not relying too much at least if memory serves me correctly, they're not relying too much on any call-ups like we've seen other teams. We've seen an influx of rookies come in and shine. Uh, You've had about one or two so far this season for the Rangers uh, really come out and shine. But for the most part, it really hasn't been that much of a a homegrown talent coming up and filling the spots this season. It's been more so than coming up last season and taking spots over or using the free agent signs you had in the offseason to basically say, we're going for this now. And they seem to kind of be staking their claim uh, in that top spot uh, at the the current point in time. Now, looking at the other side of that argument, unless you wanted to say something about that. Uh, no, but I was going to say I have a slightly different, bigger surprise Okay. so far this year. And it comes out of the National League. Okay. In a division that really is up for anyone at this point. Okay. You can probably guess which division I'm talking about. 
my surprise has been the Cincinnati Reds. Okay. And the way they have performed this year, despite a 42-38 and 38 record. But you look at the rest of their division, they're half a game up on Milwaukee right now, three and a half on Chicago, five on Pittsburgh, eight on St. Louis. That's how tight that division is right now. Mm-hmm. But they have been a pleasant surprise, and it's solely because of one of those rookies right. that we've been talking about. Ellie De La Cruz has provided a jolt. Humongous. To that entire franchise. Mm-hmm. I swear, every night on Sports Center, he's on there. Oh yeah, because of because of the plays he makes and the way he is on the base paths too. So that's been a pleasant surprise to see so far this year, and I'm hoping they keep it up because if there is a team that I am a second that there's a secondary team that I am I have fandom in, it's the Cincinnati Reds. I've always kind of just you know liked them, even when the Astros were in the same division as them. So I would love to see them be able to keep that up, but that's a tough division they're playing in right now. That's me with the Pirates. I was always a Kutch guy growing up, mm-hmm. so that that's that's me with the Pirates. So yeah, their start was fantastic for me. Yeah, <laughs> for me it was Votto and uh, yeah, the Todd father. Yeah, yeah. I had a I had actually I own a Reds Todd Frazier like T shirt. I don't know where <laughs> I got it. Or where my parents got it for me. It's but the most I, random I it. thing ever. It, it is. It, it, it's a weird <laughs> shirt. I obviously don't fit in it anymore, but it, it's interesting to say the least. So looking at the other side of the conversation in the letdowns this season, for me there's a couple. One from each side, the National League and the American League. For the American League, probably my biggest letdown so far and I don't know how much of a quote-unquote letdown it is because of injury bugs and other things that have come up, but it's the Houston Astros. They have not been able to really fulfill the the expectation that they've had all these years. Granted, you can't keep winning baseball forever. No. They're sitting 42-37, and 37, six games behind the Rangers for third in the West. But again, it's that injury bug that just one after the other continues to plague this team this season. You still have Michael Brantley out. He just got upgraded, quote unquote, to the sixty day IL just in the past week. Mm-hmm. You know, you still got a ton of players out. You we talked about it last week, where you've got Garcia out, you've got McCullers out. So it's it's just not it's not a favorable situation. And whenever they do have players healthy, they seem to kind of put it together, but it just feels like something else is missing. And that's when I kind of mentioned last week, they still need to go and get a, get an arm. Now, with all the injuries, you absolutely have to go get an arm. For sure. But that's going to be something to watch at the trade deadline, and we'll obviously talk about that more when we get closer to that next month. But they have been my biggest letdown so far in the American League. In the National League, it's been the San Diego Padres. Ah, you took mine. The the team that, that I think a lot of people were expecting to really compete at the top of the West this season with the roster they have. We highlighted it last week. They basically got star power at every single position. Yep. Probably one of the best outfields, if not the best outfield threesome that you have in all of baseball. With Soto and Tatis headlighting the, the two of the three spots in the outfield. But really, the Diamondbacks right now have finally turned that corner and have figured out a way to get it done. 48-32, and 32, leading the West. Giants 45-34, and 34, two and a half back. The Dodgers sliding down 44-34, and 34, three games back. Then the Padres in fourth, 37-42, and 42, ten and a half games back of the Diamondbacks. It is, they have probably been the biggest letdown, I would think, in baseball the, in general. The gap between third place and fifth place for them is the same. And that's bad mm-hmm. when you look at uh, – actually, no. The gap between San Diego and Colorado is shorter by half a game. By half a game. S- seven to Colorado, seven and a half to Los Angeles. And that's yeah. a problem given that Colorado's the last place team in the West and I don't think has had an ounce of relevance since 2017. Excuse me, 2018. 
They also have the third worst record in baseball. Yes, <laughs> but that's kind of easy to do when there's teams that exist in Kansas City and Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> so if I were to roll out my biggest letdowns of the year, not to piggyback off of you, mm-hmm. I'll go separately from the Astros. While I agree with you, it has been an absolute letdown so far this year. I'm hoping the second half goes a lot better, especially with what moves they have. It depends on the injuries. It depends on the injuries and what they do at the deadline. Yep. I think will depend on if the Astros, right. dare I say, Make the postseason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because the Angels ahead of them right now, and we talked about it on PlayStation last night with our buddies. Mm-hmm. Shohei Otani, my lord. Mm-hmm. The new bringer of rain. <laughs> the Japanese bringer of rain. The Japanese export, as they say in MLB. Import. Show. Import, excuse me. <laughs> well, actually, I don't know. Is it export? It's export. Is it export? Import would be us. Bring them in. Either way, we don't need to get no, into no, this. Japan, <laughs> Japan exported him to us. Yeah, yeah. He sent him to us. Whatever. Either way, it's a horrible line by Book Shiambi on the show production. So We're, we are. <laughs> we are also mascot majors. We are not. Shh, we don't have to say that publicly. <laughs> we're, 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 in, we're not English majors by any stretch uh, of the imagination. Either way, my biggest letdown in the American League. Yeah. Seattle. Interesting. Yeah. Why is that? I thought they were going to ride a bit more off that high of making the postseason last year, even though we kind of crushed their spirit Mm -hmm. in the uh, ALDS. But I thought they were going to put up more of a fight this year with the pieces that they were able to bring back. And it's they're not out of it. Yeah. Because they're nine and a half back right now. They're only three and a half back of Houston, four and a half back of the wild card because the AL Central is a joke. Right. So, the, I, I, but at their first half has been disappointing. Granted, they've lost a lot of close games, mm-hmm. but they, they've been kind of a letdown on that front. I mean, yeah, I could see that argument. I don't feel like it's a disappointment this year for the Mariners as much as it is. And I mentioned this last week. I feel like this year is a lot like the 2016 Houston Astros for the Mariners. It's we got a taste of the postseason. We know the bare minimum of what it takes. Now it's a matter of plugging the holes of what has left, returning what's come back, figuring out contract situations so we can try to make it a longevity thing. I really feel like they'll make noise next year, and I would not be surprised. I don't want to say this too early because I feel like this is probably not even remotely close to being a possibility I would not be surprised if they decided to put their name in the hat potentially for Shohei Otani in the in free agency because at the end of the day Angels aren't going to pay him that much no. sorry their owner isn't going to pay him that much I think everybody else would give up arm, leg, and then probably another foot to do it. Well, and you got to remember, you also got Trout. You got to think about too, if they're going to pay him. I well, I mean, they they don't really have to because that that right. ten, eleven, whatever your whatever contract, your contract extension. extension. But the so point they, being, <laughs> they, 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 that's not the word I was looking for. They're they, they're going to keep Trout. Obviously, yeah. they're not going to have they're not going to ship him out, and no one's yeah. going to want to shed that contract. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah th- th- this is the Angels' best shot. It really is, and it's their only shot because unless they fork up the money somehow, I they're gonna. I'm, I don't know that that you see Shohei Otani in the West. Period. Starting next season, the Mariners would be the only other team I could look at and say maybe because I'm sitting here, and as much as I would love to see him in the blue and orange, there's no way Jim Crane is spending that money. You'd have to give up the uh, sum of a small island nation in the Pacific to be able to get him here, or Seattle's going to have to do the same thing. Plus, you've already got a DH. We have a DH. Jordan. Yeah. So there's really no need for him in in the DH spot. The only reason you have him slide in there is if Brantley, well, besides that, he's going to be a two-way player if he comes to Houston. Wherever he goes, he's going to be a two-way player because of what he's done this season and last season. But the only way that the Astros may entertain as far as filling a DH spot for him in the lineup, Brantley retires after this year because of all the injury issues. Mm-hmm. You slide Jordan 
as the left fielder. And then you put Otani in. I just don't think it'll happen. I don't I don't think so either, but again, because I don't think Jim Crane would fork the money for that. And he doesn't really need to at this point. You've got two championships. It'd be nice to get a third and ride off into the sunset and end kind of the golden era of Astros baseball. Probably the best era we'll see in the next 50 some odd years probably as much as I hate to say that that's probably the case I don't think anytime soon you're going to have another scenario where you're going to get to was it six world series in seven years five world series in seven years win two of them and make the ALCS in six straight years I don't think you're going to see another another time where that's going to happen four in the last six exactly so that that's the thing I don't think you're going to see that again so It'd be nice to see it. I don't think it's going to happen, though, but but yeah. And then my letdown from the National League, and this should come as a surprise to no one, because mm-hmm. they always tend to let people down, especially their fans. Mm-hmm. The New York Mets. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You replace Jacob deGrom with JV. And let's be honest, Verlander, his tenure so far in... In Queens is not is it's been a bit rocky mm-hmm. to say the least. I mean, I might have to pull up his stats real quick and just see how he's been doing. But who's gonna beat who to the punch? <laughs> I don't know. I was a pretty good typer in elementary school. Four eleven ERA, fifty seven innings pitched so far this season with twenty seven runs given up, twenty six earned, forty nine strikeouts to fifteen walks. It's not terrible. It's not great. It's about today's average. He's two when it comes to ERA. He's two and four. You have the four point one one ERA. Yeah. So the record's not great by any means, but the ERA is kind of average. He's obviously done a lot worse than what he had last year when he won the Cy Young with the Astros before winning his second title in his career. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's one of those things where it's necessarily a bad move that they made. Because obviously you replaced Degrom with, at the time, who was the best pitcher uh, in free agency mm-hmm. in Justin Verlander, the Cy Young Award winner. So, yeah, but like I said, it just it has not been a good run as of late, and for the Mets this season. And yeah, you got Max Scherzer to compliment him, yeah, as well. But even then, yeah, he has a nice record, seven and two. Mm-hmm, on very this nice. Year. His ERA is just a touch under four. He he's been giving up a lot more runs. It's just been helping him that whenever he starts, his offense is helping him. So and the ERA thing for me, it's been kind of hard to get used to because I still most of the time have the mindset of if a pitcher doesn't go seven innings, or a starting pitcher doesn't, there's something wrong. And if you've got an ERA above three point one, you have an issue. That's got, I'm still in the early 2000s kind of starting pitcher, kind of how baseball was back then. But with the velocities up uh, and, and offense up, pitchers are not going to last as long. Getting, getting to the fifth inning, getting through the fifth inning is a basically a victory when it comes to being on the mound nowadays. Yeah, and another thing that's really been hurting them mm-hmm. is, especially the other night, I, you know, I, I think Francisco Lindor is one of the uh, – more premier infielders in all of in all of baseball. Mm-hmm. He just had a really bad air the other night. I, I, right. I'd have to go back and look at it again. But the, the, that that's what's hurt. I, not so much Lindor, but what's right. hurting them is those little moments that have started to add up for them, and that's right. why they've kind of fallen off. Because on paper, you look at their lineup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Big meet Pete. Yay, Pete Alonso. Lindor, <laughs> Jeff McNeil. Yeah. And in your outfield, you got Mark Canna, Starling Marte, Brandon Nimmo, and you got Tommy Pham at your disposal as well. And good old Daniel Vogelback is your DH. It's not a bad lineup by any means. It's not, but it hasn't produced the way that I'm sure that Mets fans have wanted. It doesn't live up to the over $500 million in spending money they had this past offseason. Mm-hmm. Not at all. So, And I think it validates for some of the owners 
this is why we don't go and spend this much money in off seasons because look at what's happening. Well, and and you look at who they have on their injured list right now. Mm-hmm. Ed Luz Diaz. Um, yeah. You got Elias Hernandez, one of their top young guns mm-hmm. as well. Sam Coonrod, a guy out of their pen. Right. And a starter in Jose Quintana. Yeah. So, and they're all on 60-day IL, mind you. So they're going to be on the shelf for a little bit. So is there a chance for them to try and turn it around? It's closing, but yes. You're 16 games back of Atlanta, who's just ran away with the division at the time yeah, being. I don't think you're winning the East by any means. You're the only one, way you're, you're in is wild card. Wild card or bust, and you're eight and a half back right now. Yeah. And so that's a, why I say it's possible, but it's, it's a, very, very much dwindling. And as of right now, a team in your division holds one of those wild cards, and that's mm-hmm. Miami. Yeah. So we'll see. AL and NL MVPs. Mm hmm. So far, through the first half, AL MVP, without a doubt, Shohei Otani, the greatest athlete in the world today. Yes, glad you agree, yes. <laughs> folks. There has been a ongoing debate based off a of tweet. I want to say it was either Talking Bats or it was John Boy's uh, Twitter page. It asked the question, "Who's better?" Shohei Otani in baseball or Patrick Mahomes in football? Who's the better athlete? And we have differing views on this, mainly because you have the argument of championships. Mm -hmm. I have the argument of that argument is horrible. You look at the, the body of work. If Mahomes was playing both quarterback and safety and getting interceptions to give himself back the ball well, and, or defensive end, that would be one thing. And, and, and that's <laughs> and that's why I think the overall argument between Otani and Mahomes is stupid because baseball and football are two completely different sports. Mm-hmm. Otani's able to play both sides of the ball. You can't do that in professional football. No. You, that, can't. you, you can't. So I, I, that's why I don't think you can make that comparison. That's why mm-hmm. I went the championship route because – Kansas City for a long time, like Anaheim, Mm -hmm. had been a really tough sports town, especially in football, until they got Mahomes. Yes. And Anaheim, since their World Series win in 2002, Mm -hmm. had struggled until they got Trout and Otani. Yes, but that is also partly because of the ownership and the lack of, what's the word, trying. Right? They kind of show that they try with getting players like Anthony Rendon, who is hurt every other week of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got some decent starters. You, you, you have a decent starter, decent bullpen, not great by any means. But it's decent enough to get you wins and get you through a season and kind of fight for a, a playoff spot, but it's not where it needs to be. And my argument or my, my stance on the argument kind of mm-hmm. flipped after what Otani did last night. Yeah. Uh, the striking out 10 and then hitting two home runs in that same game. Yeah, that, that was impressive. <laughs> very, very impressive. Because, so, I mean, you, you look at at, his, at Otani's numbers, and I agree with you. He, he's my, my AL MVP favorite so far this year. He's hitting 304 with 93 hits, 28 home runs, league-leading 28 home runs, a, one, a 1,040 OPS, which is astronomical. He has stolen 11 bases as a base runner. To go with the 77 for his career in Major League Baseball. Uh, 64 RBI so far in the year. 55 runs scored himself. You then look at his pitching numbers. 7-3 and three record. 302 ERA. 16 starts. 95 and a third innings pitched. 127 strikeouts and a 104 whip. Just for the generic numbers. How many walks? He has... Let's look. This season in total, he has... 39 walks to the 127 strikeouts. He's got nothing on my MLB The Show character. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Here we go. I have 107 <laughs> strikeouts to six walks right now in AAA. Does he allow a batting average of, a, of only 180? I'd have to go back and look. <laughs> gosh, we're bad. But either way, point being, like you said, he is, bar none, the clear favorite. You want to even know another reason why? Like I said, he's hit 28 home runs, league-leading 28 home runs this season as a hitter. He's only given up 12. Mm. He hasn't even given up 
half of what he's hit and produced himself at the plate over the fence. I think that says it all. <laughs> this is one of the greatest players we have seen since Babe Ruth, the only other comparison in regards to a, a two-way player that baseball has ever seen. Yep. And right now with the Angels, it's even more of a letdown right now because you have greatest player of all time number one and potentially greatest player of all time number two in Trout and Otani sitting both in your lineup and in your bullpen. And you've done nothing. <laughs> you've given Trout one playoff win? 2014. <laughs> what? It's so embarrassing. It is. It really is. Because but. because it harkens back to the point. Yeah. You can't win a team sport of baseball with one or two players. Right. It's impossible. I've, I've been going back and looking at some old Astros highlights and from, from our early runs in the postseason, and I've come to realize that our, one of our starting lineups at one point, the top five, mm-hmm. Were have been considered for the Hall of Fame. Two yeah. of which have are in the Hall of Fame. Yep. In Craig Biggio and Jeff Bagwell. Mm-hmm. Who else was in the top part of that lineup? Lance Berkman, who was considered. Jeff Kent, who was considered. And there's one more that's slipping my mind, and I don't know why it is right now, but he was also considered for the Hall of Fame. Either way, you can't win a team sport of baseball with just one or two guys. Mm-hmm. It's impossible, and that is exactly why L.A., or the Angels, excuse me, have not been able to, heck, I'd, I'd, I'd argue the other L.A. team as well. They're little Mickey Mouse trophy, <laughs> stupid crap. Um, Are you saying that because of my World Series championship I have no, on right now? No, no. <laughs> I'm saying it's the pieces you put around them that right. are going to be key to your success. And, again, it harkens back to Moreno not being a great owner by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Not putting good pieces or at least, you know, substantial pieces around them, because I think Jared Walsh is a hell of a player. Right. Um, and amongst and Anthony Rendon when he's healthy. So that's what it harkens back to, and that's why you haven't seen a whole lot of success there. Looking at the National League MVP, I'll give mine first. You can give yours. Uh, I don't know if you have kind of a different thought on this, but mine, Ronald Acuna Jr. from mm. the Atlanta Braves, only 25 years old. He's... Two years younger than me. <laughs> He's the same age as me. Yeah. You're apparently the same age as the current front runner for the National League MVP award. Congratulations. Yeah. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> uh, 71 runs scored, 106 hits, 19 homers, a 330 batting average, 51 RBIs, 36 stolen bases for him on the season so far, and an OPS just shy of 1,000 at 991 on the year. He has had a fantastic season for Atlanta for the 25-year-old right fielder? Mine? Mm-hmm. I was leaning towards Acuna. Yeah. But my pick, who he probably won't win MVP, but he for dang sure is going to win the batting title in the National League. Okay. Luis Arias. Okay. With Miami. Mm-hmm. An incredible year. We were talking about it last night. Right. We're almost at the All-Star break. And prior to last night, was batting above 400. <laughs> it's that's, insane. That's unheard of. Insane. It's only heard of in the show when you have your player at 99. Or you play on rookie on purpose. Or you're playing on rookie stats. on purpose to boost stats, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Luis, I write. Luis, what, what, what did I, I feel put? like that one hit you a little personally. No, no. What, <laughs> one, one, one of the things, I, I think it was Tyler that said it, one of our friends said it yeah. last night. Luis Arias is just taking batting practice against MLB yes. players. He really is. He really is. And it's been very, very impressive to watch. Like you said, you do not. You only really see it in college, and you very rarely see it in college. You more so see it in high school than you do anywhere else of people even touching you, 400 this deep into a season. We saw it this year with the Bearcats. Tyler Davis was above 400 all year long. Yeah. That's, and it's that's a rarity. Only, yeah, it is. That's why he was number one in all of baseball in hits and batting average. Mm-hmm. Is because nobody else goes above 400. It stays there consistently. Cruz with LSU. Yeah. For the last few years, he's hit like 360-something. That's fantastic. But even he couldn't get to a 400 batting average. And he's going to go top two in the draft. Right, exactly. That's the thing. It's like, it's impossible to do almost, it seems like. so. And 
Yeah. Arias is doing it at the major leagues. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I could look at his uh, his game by game stats right now. Holy cow! Um, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's at least right now on a ten game hitting streak. Right now, I'd have to go even probably further back than that. You know what? We got time. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, either way, he's my pick right now for MVP because I mean, yeah, my, in Miami's the team that's right behind uh, Atlanta right now in, in the division. So. He, he he's just good. Mm-hmm. He he's really good. Let's see. Okay, yeah, he's he is on a one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, ten game win- hitting streak. Not bad. Not right bad. now, there was a little valley there against Seattle, mm-hmm. and then prior to that, it was a uh, almost another ten game hitting streak. So right. he has hit in at least twenty of his last twenty three games. Mm-hmm. So he he he's my pick right now to be the NL MVP. If he doesn't get that, he better get the batting title. He absolutely has to, especially if he even stays remotely close to the run that he's currently having uh, at the plate, then absolutely. So quickly here before we we move on to the MLS, because we only have a few minutes or so left here uh, in this first hour of the show. Look at the play at if the season ended today in the playoff picture currently, I'll run through the standings for you, right? Number one seed in the American League, Tampa Bay Rays. Yep. Winners of the East. Number two seed in the American League, the Texas Rangers, winners of the West. The number three team in the Central, the winners of the Central, the Minnesota Twins. The top of the wild card, the Baltimore Orioles, getting that first wild card spot, followed by the New York Yankees and the LA Angels. That is your current playoff situation in the American League. The National League, Atlanta Braves, winners of the East, number one record in the National League. They take the top seed. Arizona Diamondbacks, winners of the West, number two in the West, in the National League. Winners of the Central and the Cincinnati Reds at number three, followed by the Miami Marlins getting the number one wild card spot. San Francisco Giants behind them, and L.A. Dodgers sneaking their way in to the sixth seed of the National League. Looking at that scenario, first, it's weird to think about because of the dynamic shift that has happened in baseball. And I've said this over the last couple of days. I think I mentioned it to you yesterday, actually, when we were just talking personally. I was saying that as much as I hate the Astros struggling as much as they are right now, I love the dynamic and the power shift in baseball right now with all the teams that have been very... Very bad over the last five, six years being the ones on top of Major League Baseball. For me, it's- I absolutely love it. But the the question here, how much of the current playoff picture do we see change? Do we see it change at all? Do we see it completely flip back to what it's been in years past? Or do we see a new dynamic start to form with this postseason as to who's at the top of Major League Baseball? If you want me to break it down by league, I, and when I look at the American League, I don't think so much the East changing mm-hmm. at the top. I think Tampa Bay rides this hot streak that they're on right now. Like, I know they lost last night, but I think they're going to keep it going. I think Baltimore is going to stay in their spot right now. I think for sure Baltimore is making the postseason. Yay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Playoff moments at Camden that, Yards. <laughs> that Central is so hard to gauge because right. it's so bad. Minnesota the t- the winner of the Central right now, 40 and 41. And Chicago the White Sox are 34 and 47 and they're 6 games back. Yep. Aside from Kansas City, that division's up for grabs and it could change in a heartbeat heartbeat which is weird to think about that Detroit could be in a position to try and make the postseason. I mean the Guardians are only a game and a half. Yeah. So, like you said, it's anybody's ball game. And then as for the West, this is just me talking out loud. I think the Angels fall off mm-hmm. because someone's going to get hurt. Rendo. And I don't – probably. I don't I, wish that. I, I hope don't, not for his sake. But I, yeah. I don't wish it on anybody whatsoever, obviously, but it just always happens. Yep. And that's their downfall. I think Texas is going to maybe hang on and win this division. I think there's a 
good chance of that. But I think the Astros will slide in as a wild card, which is something they haven't done in quite a long time. Since 2015. Yeah. So when they beat the Yankees and got to the DS. Right. So I think we would sl- that would be the one flip, I think, mm-hmm. is that we're going to flip into one of those wild card spots with Baltimore and New York. As I mentioned last week, it's the Rangers' division to lose. And it's going to be that way until either the Astros figure it out and and or get players healthy, mm-hmm. or the Rangers start to backslide a bit. And then for the National League, I think National League might be a little bit more cut and dry outside of the Central. Right. I think the East, Atlanta, takes that division with ease. Miami, I think, is going to hang around up there. Philadelphia is still in it uh, in terms of the wild card. Yeah, I think they're going to be – they're either going to be first team out or they're going to be last team in. Like they were last year. Exactly. And then for the West, I think it's going to be a battle between Arizona and San Francisco. I yeah. don't even think L.A. gets into that mix. No, I think – I know they're in the mix now, and they, they will be for a little bit. But I think down the stretch of the year in August and September, I think Arizona and San Francisco are going to battle it out for the West. Winner obviously gets – the probably will have the number two seed, mm-hmm. and then the loser is in the wild card. Currently, with that that National League West, Diamondbacks, like I said, are the two seed. Then you have the Giants as the five seed. And the Dodgers are the Dodgers is the six seed. Right behind the Dodgers, though, Philly is at seven. Milwaukee. Brewers at eight. Technically, they're not out of it yet. The Cubs at nine. So if they go on a magical run, they could enter themselves in the postseason race, including the Padres, who are still technically in it. Obviously, because it's way too far to eliminate teams, but well, it's probably not going to happen with the Padres. So I, you're looking at Phillies, Brewers, or Cubs on a magic run to I, take over the Dodgers. I don't think the Cubs are going to be in the picture for the wild card. I no. think they're still in the picture for that whole division. They could be because <sighs> St. Louis is 12 games under 500 and they're eight games back. Yeah. It's and, just it's just going to depend in, on the Reds. It, it, at the end of the day, I think it depends on how the Reds perform down the stretch and how Milwaukee performs yeah. down the stretch as to who is going to come out on top of that division. That's why I think the playoff picture could shift a little bit in the NL because of that central. Same thing applies in the AL. Right. So, But that's why we love baseball. <laughs> Last thing here in the MLB section of the show, we're halfway through this season. Going into the season, as per the the collective bargaining agreement, there were new rules that were put in place to start this year. The three inches added to each side of the bases, mm-hmm. the uh, the limit on the disengagements before you then get called a balk, the pitch clock, and everything else that got changed within baseball. Quick little 30-second kind of wrap-up. Halfway through the season, do you think that these new rules have worked? And do you think there should be any changes made to them, or should they just be gone? I think the basis thing is fine, Mm -hmm. because I think that, for one thing, it's going to limit on injuries whenever you're running down the base paths. Mm Mm-hmm. And with with guys on base and everything, it's kind of like you know how softball does it, where they have that like extra the base safety off, base, the safety base off to the right. Yeah. So it's the similar thing baseball's trying to do there. I think they hit a home run, no pun intended, with that. Um, the pitch clock has definitely sped games up. To me, from the beginning, I think it's just not baseball. Mm-hmm. I know why they're doing it because you know the game has historically been very long. Right. So if they if they if they stick with kind it, kind of yeah. If they stick with it, that's fine mm-hmm. and everything. That's not the rule I wanted to change. I wanted to change the extra inning rule. but Yeah, the um, Ghost Runner thing, I'm not a fan of. No. I'm not or the Ghost Runner, but yeah, I'm not a fan of it at all. No, not at all. So they, they've done well with some of these rules. Mm-hmm. Some tweaking here and there would help. I think for me, like you said, the bases – Fine with whatever, right? Looks like a pizza box that you go pick up from Domino's, not a sponsor. But either way, whatever. Sure. It it helps player safety. And yeah, whatever. The pitch clock, I think, could deal with some tweaking. I I was a huge, huge person of no pitch clock, never, never, never. Don't time baseball, right? It's worked Better than I expected, but as Rich Eisen has said, 
turn it off starting in the ninth inning. Because for one big example, the World Baseball Classic, the final, the very last out of the whole thing, Otani versus Trout, the two best players the sport has probably ever seen facing off for the U.S. or Japan to win the World Baseball Classic. Every single one of those pitches would have been a pitch clock violation had that been instituted in the World Baseball Classic. Thank God it was not. And that is the running argument and the prime example from Rich Eisen and from myself. I'm a big Rich Eisen guy, so I agree with him on certain things. This is one of them. Starting in that ninth inning, I would say starting in the ninth inning, if it's within a certain amount of runs, turn it off. If it's like a seven-run ball game, don't don't turn it off. Yeah, leave right? it going. Leave it going. But if it's within two runs, maybe three, turn it off. Turn it off and let the game happen the way it has been, right? I think this postseason, you're going to really see what kind of an impact that pitch clock has because of the fact that most of those postseason games go four-plus hours. Yeah, It's not the regular season, you know, three-hour, ten-minute games. Those are four-and-a-half-hour games. They're not short by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. So I think that is going to be huge, The seeing how the pitch clock performs in the postseason, how many violations come in the postseason, and seeing what that may or may not do for a potential tweaking of the rules uh, coming in this – Jesus, microphone – coming in this, uh, this offseason coming up here. Quick final thing before we head to another break as we're nearing the uh, top of the hour. Messi to the MLS. This has been something that, for some reason, came as a huge shock to a lot of people. This is something that, if you've been following soccer close enough, you know, even if you're a casual fan, you'll know this has been something that's been rumored for the last four or five years now. There's even been rumors of Ronaldo coming at some point. I don't think that'll happen. But Messi coming to the MLS has been something that's been talked about for the last three, four years, definitely. And especially when Inter-Miami FC was created by the David Beckham group, it became even more of a thing because now with him playing with other clubs, it then created an opportunity to create the pipeline through the, 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 the sub-club co- connection, whatever it's called, sister club, I guess, uh, of getting him to Inter-Miami FC to officially sign. The deal is roughly around $53 million annually, according to a website called Sport. Oh, no, caps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, those numbers don't include the agreement with Apple and Adidas, however, with the Adidas agreement that he has now in the MLS mm-hmm. and the new Apple docu-series, Apple TV+, Plus, that is basically going to be a four-part docu-series that's going to detail his first World Cup appearance to winning the title this past uh, World Cup in Qatar and kind of going through that whole time frame and his journey to getting the title finally and cementing his spot as the best player in the world. You look at his amount he's making cur- to current to the economics of, of the MLS. He actually was making with uh, Paris Saint-Germain, I believe is where he was before. PSG. PSG. Yeah, Paris Saint-Germain. He was making at least... 10 million more. But with the way that the salary cap, quote unquote, or the financial limits are in the MLS, he wasn't going to be able to make that much. That's mm-hmm. why all the added incentives come in with the part of the revenue from the Apple TV or the, the MLS season pass subscribers and everything else comes in to supplement that extra 10 million. The current highest paid player, not including Messi, Chicago Fire midfielder Zierdin Shakiri. Just over eight million. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the financial impact because you know right away Miami's making that money back almost instantaneously. Yes, there were people who were wearing Miami Messi jerseys within hours, within two hours of his announcement and signing. They were wearing his jersey to the NBA Finals game in Miami that night. Mm-hmm. That is how quickly. These things happen. It's about a two and a half year long contract on an estimate. Um, it's in the docu series, but this whole thing with with Messi 
is insane for the fact that, first off, it's the greatest player in the world playing in America. Yes. That usually does not happen. There's a whole thing about the wonder kid, Christian Pulisic, being America's savior for the World Cup, basically. But other than that, you have not had anybody else this magnitude except David Beckham and Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Wayne Rooney when they've made their runs in, in the MLS. But when it comes to the impact on the MLS, for me at least, Messi being in America is going to grow the sport humongously to a point I don't think anybody has ever seen before. It's no secret when you look at the professional sports landscape in Mm -hmm. the United States that the MLS is at the bottom. Right. Behind behind the NHL. Just behind the NHL. (laughs) I'd even put a little bit more of a valley between them and the NHL. Because the NHL has been able to pick up a lot of steam lately with teams yeah. moving around and stuff like that. And the ESPN deal and probably helps. And the ESPN helps. deal really helped them out. Yeah. Behind NHL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the cash cow that is the NFL. Right. This is going to boost the MLS to be up there with the other major sports again because you have a high-profile player once again. And that's not to take anything away from David Beckham, Ibrahimovic, and uh, Rooney. and Rooney. All great players in their own right, probably top 10 all time uh, for a couple of them. Mm-hmm. A lot of people around the world love Lionel Messi. I could say that for a full blown fact that my cousins in the Philippines who are big, excuse me, football fans. They love Messi. Right. And I I called my cousin Ethan when I told him, I was like, hey, he's coming to play here in, in America. And he was like, I didn't even know America had, like, was big on soccer. And there I was like, go. and I was like, well, now we are. <laughs> <laughs> if we weren't before, we are now. <laughs> See, I, I, I'll put it out there. I'm not a soccer fan mm-hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. Will I watch the World Cup? Yes, because I love you know, World Cup, you know, style sports like the Olympics and stuff like that. I love watching that stuff. It's fun to watch. I don't think I've watched an MLS game from start to finish since the last time the Dynamo won a championship. Jeez. So. 2007. I believe so, yes. Yeah, so, that was the last time they won it. Yeah. So it's been a while since I've even paid remote attention to the MLS. Mm. Will this change that for me personally? Probably. I'll maybe keep an eye on it a little bit more, especially whenever, you know, Miami plays Houston. But it's going to grow the sport to lengths that this continent has not seen. Right. Yet. Right. I mean, because you, you look at North America, the, 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 the prime soccer talent has come out of Mexico. Mm-hmm. That they've been the the leader when it comes to North America, not not all of Concacaf, but but North America the big itself, three. the big three. Right now, America since starting in international play, really getting things going in the '90s with the MLS and with the NWSL coming shortly after, has really started to kind of uptick the amount of talent that is homegrown in America. For one thing, two of the best players, three of the best players to ever lace them up for America. Clint Dempsey. Yep. Boy from Nacogdoches. Mm -hmm. Landon Donovan. Of course. One of the greatest goals in American history with the 2010 World Cup goal Mm -hmm. to send them to the the knockout stage. And to Marcus Beasley, who ended up having some time with the Houston Dynamo. Spent a few years here in Houston. Uh, as a defender itself. And are you saying those three? Those three being some of the best players in American history. Yes. Was Tim Howard not an American product? No, he was. I just was going with the three players that aren't in goal. Okay. Right. But, you know, and there's some more players as well. You got Alexi Lawless, who's a commentator now. He was a very good player in his own right. Uh, you got a ton more players. Tim Howard as well, one of, the, or not one of the best goalkeeper America's ever had. Um, How can you forget Houston legend Brian Ching? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't play for America. I know. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? That's the joke. I know. <laughs> Point being, though, like you said, it's going to not only fast track, but it's going to grow the sport at lengths in the United States, at least in the continental United States. Don't know how much 
soccer is much of a thing in Alaska or Hawaii, right? But it's there. But in the continental U.S., it's going to have more of an impact, I would think, because of just in general, that's where most all the teams are located. You don't have a team in Hawaii. You don't have a team in Alaska. But it's going to grow the game in America humongously. And I think you won't see the impact right away in regards to national team talent. I think you may see a couple of players who have dual citizenship decide U.S. over another country potentially. But I think in about 10 years' time, you'll see the kids who got into soccer because Messi was in the MLS, now competing in U.S. youth camps and competing in, in trying to get a roster for the World Cup and start to really see even more of the elevation of American soccer to what we've already seen in the last few years as a team that has started to be considered a dangerous one to watch in every single World Cup. And now, with North America hosting the World Cup, with all but three matches in the Continental 48 of America, it's going to have an insane impact. All this just crash coursing all at the same time. Eyes of the world will be on our country. And it'll be the first time since, I want to say, the 98... No, 94 World Cup when it was hosted, I believe, in Chicago. I believe so. Actually, yeah, because I just recently watched the June 17th mm-hmm. documentary on ESPN. Fantastic documentary, by the way. You have to watch it. The one thing I will say about it, the fact that there was no narration from anybody not in news coverage is, and honestly, it was perfect. Yeah. It told the story better than somebody narrating it. I'm going to be honest with you. Only time's going to (laughs) tell how this all pan out. All right. We'll step aside and take a quick break when we come back. NBA draft. Who won it? Who lost it? And is it going to change any team's trajectory going forward? Coming up after this on the KCM Sports Podcast. And welcome back here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. I'm Carlos Zimmerman. He's Jordan Smith. Time to dive into our recap of the NBA draft. And as a surprise to absolutely no one, <laughs> when Bayama goes first. Right. If he did not go first, someone in San Antonio was getting fired. I think the whole franchise would have been fired. It would have collapsed on itself. I think the citizens of San Antonio would have probably rioted. He he, he, <laughs> he was obviously the consensus number one pick, yeah. and that is who San Antonio took. Obviously, San Antonio getting a big W mm-hmm. by getting one of the high, more highly touted players in recent history. Right. And then you move along in the draft. Hornets take Brandon Miller, mm-hmm. despite the controversy that surrounds him. Yeah. But they still went after him and got yeah. him, so... Good move for him because at the end of the day, despite all the controversy, great player. The top five picks went about as I expected them to go. I thought Miller and Henderson were interchangeable, Mm -hmm. but it went about as I expected with Miller going second, Scoot Henderson going third, and then the Thompson brothers going four and five. Right. Big grab for Houston. Prayers answered. (laughs) That took you a second. Yeah, it did. (laughs) (laughs) And then, I'm just, I'm... yeah, all right. <laughs> and then his brother going to Detroit. So right. I, I thought, you know, all five of the teams made the picks they needed to make there. You know, th- this draft was interesting, mm-hmm. and I think it's 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 gotten interesting because not only it used to be back in the day you could draft players out of high school. Mm-hmm. You know, LeBron, Kobe, guys that did not play college basketball. Right, Yao Ming. Um, that's kind of been flipped now right. to these club teams that you see players playing, like Henderson playing for G League Ignite, the Thompsons playing for City Reapers out of Overtime Elite. Mm-hmm. So we've started to see that a lot more and gain a lot more prevalence. But when you look at 
through most of this draft, it it was just in those top few picks. Right. Beyond that, it was mostly either international schools or you pulled from the college pool. And so if we want to look at winners and losers, I'll take a look at some winners here. Obviously, the Spurs. I think the Rockets got a big W in this draft, and that's not even me being biased. They were able to get the guy they needed. But Cam Whitmore fell right into their laps. I was just about to bring that up. Somehow he fell out of a what most experts were saying was a very, very high lottery pick and got him at 20. That was a prayer answered. Best case scenario if you are the Houston Rockets. I mean, looking at this at this article from The Ringer, loser. Every team that passed on Cam Whitmore. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. I mean, even the Warriors, who were considered a, a potential winner of this draft as well, they passed on him at 19. They had him in their hands. And they said, nah, we're good. Well, that's interesting you bring up the Warriors pick right before. Yeah. Because this, for me, personally, this is one of the more rare cases where I got to see an NBA prospect in person. Right. Because the guy they took was Brandon Pajimski from Santa Clara, who the Bearcats beat in the NIT. And let me tell you, from watching him firsthand, and I even got to talk to him Mm -hmm. after the game, first off, great guy. Right. You know, very humble, and he is going to be an absolute great asset for Golden State if they use him properly. Mm -hmm. Because I know they've, they've put together some great guards. Right. Over the years, Curry being one of them. (laughs) Yeah. No less getting him from a mid-major, too. Mm -hmm. So they know how to craft those guys that are from smaller teams. Right. An absolute incredible player. So the Golden State got a really good grab of him. He can shoot the lights out from three, which is the M.O. right now in the NBA is the three-pointer. And no defense whatsoever. That's beside the point. Um so, I, 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 yeah, Golden State passed up on Whitmore, but I still think they made a good pick with Bajemski. Right. But Cam Whitmore falling to the Rockets was huge. In this article, it says that the, tech, the Texans, the Rockets, it's kind of the same situation. They almost have too much young talent, right? And that's something that we kind of touched on last week is that you're probably going to have to get rid of some of that young talent to bring in some veteran guys, whether it's some trade or whatever, right? Uh, but... In general, having Whitmore and Thompson both sitting there with Jabari Green, with Kevin Porter, this is going to be a very, very nice roster put together for this next season. Are they going to have a huge jump? No. They're not going to have a huge jump. You're not going to see Thompson probably right away. I think you'll see him just as a more rotation guy. I wouldn't be surprised if Cam Whitmore spent some time in Rio Grande before really starting to make an impact in Houston, I would think. But... Yeah, I really don't think you're going to see too much of them in the beginning. But also, I really don't think the Rockets are, with this, still going to make a huge impact on the court right away. I think it's going to have to take another veteran couple of free agents at least to start getting close to a 500 record and still not being one of the seller dwellers of the NBA, especially the Western Conference. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, yeah, it, it, it was a very... It, it was almost a dreamlike draft, if you will, for the Houston Rockets. Kind of cap off what's been a very good draft for the last three or so years. A couple other guys that I saw that went in the draft that I thought were steals for some of these franchises. Um, Memphis being able to grab Marcus Sasser at 25 mm-hmm. was very stunning. And, you know, I, you know, am I the voice of the Bearcats? Yes. But I do love watching Houston Cougar basketball. Right. It is a very fun product. It really is. That they have put out there. Especially by Kelvin Sampson. Absolutely. Another guy that I got to see firsthand, not because I was broadcasting for him, but I just got to see him. Julian Strother out of Gonzaga going to Indiana at 29. Man, this guy is a multi-tool player. Yeah. He can shoot, but boy, can he defend underneath as well. Mm -hmm. So that was a big grab for Indiana right at the tail end of the uh, first round. So lots of steals for them, for, for a lot of teams. But, you know, I didn't pay attention enough to the draft to where I think, can I pick out a loser? Oh, I, th- I think everybody can at this point. Say it with me. One, two, three. The Hornets. 
That number two pick, a lot of the fan base did not like that pick no. at all. There's even video. <laughs> There's video of the Hornets mascot, Hugo, apparently being disappointed at the watch party at, at the arena uh, when, they, they, when they took Brandon Miller over Scoot Henderson. They mostly wanted Scoot. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't blame them. They should have had Scoot. I know, but I, I don't even care about all the other stuff. Scoot should have been the number two pick. Bar none. At least for me. He should have been number two. I can't form a really great opinion on Scoot Henderson because I, have, uh, I, mm-hmm. I wasn't able to see much on him. Right. Because, you know, because I'm a college basketball junkie. Yeah. I got to see Brandon Miller most of this season watching SEC basketball, and I thought he was one of the best players in not just the SEC, but the entire country. Oh, no, he is. So, he is. so I understood why Charlotte took him at number two because, right. you know, they, they could use some help at the three. It's not going to be instantaneous. They could use some help at a lot of things. A, a lot of things. <laughs> you know, the, the five on the floor. The, the, the new bench, owner. <laughs> the uh, front office. Um, the yeah. fan base. Um, now, the fans are great. It, the fans are great. They just haven't been subjected to a lot of, of the winning city basketball. Of, like, can we just talk about this? The city of Charlotte has not had, you know, great professional sports no. between the Panthers. The Hornets has not been for a very the long Hornets time. The Hornets for a long time, even back to the original Hornets. Yeah. And and the Bobcats, too. R.I.P. I still want uh, that Gerald Wallace Bobcat jersey. Who's that one big guy that played for them? Um I was, uh, he was a stud in 2K14. Oh, um, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I got to look it up now. <laughs> I have to look it up now. It's, it's Bobcats gonna... were, were, a, were a favorite of the rest of mine. Yeah. Growing up. They, they were a favorite of the rest. Hold on. I got, I got, I got to look it up. Hold Jeopardy on. music, please. Uh, you want to you no. edit that in? No, I don't want to edit that in, and I don't want to get a copyright strike. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> what? His name. You said Gerald Henderson, right? No, Gerald Wallace. Gerald Wallace, thank you. <laughs> You're thinking of a different, way different player. Yeah, that, totally. <laughs> I, I'm looking for his name here, and I'm just... I got you. Hold up. No, do you? <laughs> it's Bismack Biombo. He was a yeah. stud. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about him, but In yeah. 2K. Yeah, that um, is that is true. Um... Oh, let's see. Yeah, there's Gerald Henderson, Al Jefferson, Michael Kid Gilchrist. There's another That's one. That's the one I was thinking of, Kid Gilchrist. Kid Gilchrist. Yeah. And then, of course, Kemba Walker. Kemba Walker. <laughs> Cardiac Kemba. <laughs> oh, and wow. Cody Zeller. <laughs> they had decent players. They just could never put it together. Cody Zeller, the new white chocolate. <laughs> anyway. We're getting way off track here, as we always do. Just a little bit. So, yeah, that that Charlotte's probably the big loser. Yeah. In that, yeah. and uh, now the question is, who's going to improve the most from last season to next with their draft picks? And, <clears throat> people, pe- people would make the argument that, oh, San Antonio is going to be an instant improvement. See, and, and I don't see that. I don't either. I see, for me, it's not going to be a immediate impact for any team. Unless he's a starter and goes 25 points a game in the first 10 games of the season – you're not going to see an immediate impact. I don't think you'll see as much of an impact in regards to teams winning or not until after the All-Star break. And there's one note that I hated, or one comparison that mm-hmm. I hated during the draft. Yeah. The last three picks that San Antonio has had at the number one pick, they took David Robinson, mm-hmm. generational talent, Yep. Tim Duncan, and then they took Win Banyama. You can't compare Win Banyama mm-hmm. to Tim Duncan and David Robinson. One, their builds are completely different. Mm-hmm. Two, all three are playing in three different eras of the NBA. I have a question. Hmm. <laughs> Did you see the picture of all three of them with Manu Ginobili and another Spurs legend all having dinner? Just a couple, I I, just a day I, or two I, I, after I the draft. I didn't see the picture. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, good for he, them. He's got, he's got some legendary mentors. He's, got, <laughs> I know he's got great mentors. It's just a matter yeah. of will it translate? Yes. And I, and I get what you're saying because yeah, it is a little unfair to do it to somebody and just put the pressure on immediately. 
but this is a very this is a generational talent. I agree. He he and, and he, he could be the next Duncan, and he's got time to develop too because he's nineteen. Exactly, and he's still got pop because pop will never leave that franchise. <laughs> he's got more money right now than <laughs> I did at nineteen. It's probably you and I combined. Uh, he and has I, more money than ninety nine point nine percent of nineteen year olds had at that age. Yes. So that's not even a comparison. No. <laughs> so like, and, and yet he, he's got the height. Yeah. To help him there, I mean, he could probably dunk standing up. So um, I remember those days. Yeah. Yeah. All right. On a five foot goal. No, I'm talking about Yao, not me. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no athleticism in this body. <laughs> I've seen you play softball. It's yeah. it, it's not it's, a, it's not a pretty look. It's not a sight to see. <laughs> so, like I said, I just I don't think we should draw those comparisons mm-hmm. just yet because we haven't seen what he can do on an NBA court. Because let's be honest, basketball between France and the United States it's a different dynamic, completely different. So let's see how he does right. when he hits the court for the first time. Right. And if he turns out to be great, you can take me out back and <laughs> do whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying, let's wait. Right. And see what he can do. Right. So, going into our final segment, it's a new, I guess, new segment. If you're fans of any shows that we've done before, uh, our last one behind the mic uh, over on the student radio station is Sam Houston. Um, we had our segment called our, uh, our Last Minute Rant or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Where basically we just ranted about something random in sports or whatever in general. For the last minute of the show, we each had a little bit of that. We're now going to kind of take that concept and do a little bit different. It's called The Final Note. And we'll have a specific segment that we kind of discuss every single week. Uh, And this week, it's going to be looking at this weekend and the changing landscape of college athletics. Obviously, July 1 is the, every single year, the start of the new calendar year for NCAA Athletics. And for a lot of, of financial, you know, colleges usually have their new year start July 1. A lot of businesses start July 1. That's kind of their benchmark. So it's it's going to be a lot of change and a lot of new unknown coming in this Saturday. I mean, yep. even Sam Houston, they're jumping up to Conference USA, joining the FBS for the first time in school history. I mean, you kind of look at, at some of the the teams, we'll go through the ones that are leaving this next this Saturday, and we'll also dive into a little bit of the ones that are just a few of them that are leaving in the years to come. The biggest one, obviously, being Oklahoma and Texas leaving the anchor that they are in the Big Twelve and jumping ship to the SEC next summer. Yes, so that will make the SEC sixteen schools deep and in that conference and as the rumors that i've heard is that they're going to break up divisions they're not going to do divisions anymore they're not going to do eight and eight yeah you can't do that with with 16 schools and you're bringing over two regional schools as well texas right. and oklahoma you have to have them in the same division you right. can't split them up yeah because you're going to so, have the red river game the ut a&m game is going to get rebirthed and rumor i heard is that's the regular season finale next year uh, that's what right it, around thanksgiving well that's what it used to be Yep. The, the Lone Star shootout always used to be A&M versus right. Texas so they're, they're bringing on it back. Thanksgiving Day. So, so they'll bring it back. They're basically bringing it back. You could see matchups like you had in the old Big 12 with UT against Arkansas. You got you got those matchups. You've now got uh, Mizzou mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a potential game. You, it, there's a lot of opportunity with this. So that's going to be interesting to see when that actually shifts. In 24, honestly. And then um, the other big shift yeah. in 24 is USC and UCLA yeah. leaving the Pac-12 and joining the Big Ten. Yeah. When I originally saw that come out, I thought, oh my lord, the travel. <laughs> Going from the West Coast oh, it's bad. to the Midwest. Oh, it's bad. There, there have been 3D kind of renderings of like flight plans, the amount of, it's over 7,000 miles. Yeah. For all their trips combined. And and I get why they're doing it. <laughs> but, and you know, in terms of the competition level, I don't. I, I think... It, it's it, much better. It's a boost for the Big Ten. It is, it's much better for the Big Ten, but it's better for USC and UCLA. And that's the main thing. The Big Ten is obviously on a much bigger pedestal. Because you look at the Power Five. 
Pac-12 is underneath the Big 12, in my opinion, bar none. Pac-12 is the worst out of the out of the group out of the, out of the Power Five. I think it varies from sport to sport. Mm-hmm. But if we're looking at the moneymaker football, yeah. If you wanted me to rank the Power Five, SEC at the top, mm-hmm. Big Ten is second. Yep. For me, Big 12's third. ACC's fourth. Pac-12's fifth. I think nowadays you could see Big 12 as number three. Historically, you would put the ACC third. When you look at your Clemson's, yeah. your Florida State's, the Georgia Tech of old. Um, Probably. And, Probably. And, and, you know, so the, the way I look at it now is that the, I think I feel like the ACC's kind of fallen off a little bit. A little because of Clemson not doing as well. Right. And and Notre Dame, even though they're not an ACC member officially, they are by schedule per, you know, hand. So it's. I don't know why they don't just do it. They're in the ACC and everything else. Right. So that, right. that's a story for another day. But yeah, I mean, kind of looking at that. So yeah. that, that that's me on that. So, but now with now that Power Five could definitely shift when you look at the moves coming up. On Saturday. Yep. Big 12 making a big shift. Huge shift. Bring it's it. it's the defining shift of whether or not the conference is here to stay. As much as I hate to say it, this is that point where they need to make that, that mark. You add Cincinnati and Houston, who has been waiting a long time to get into the doors of the Big and 12. Begging their way to get in. And then Central Florida, the UCF, those three from the American – and then adding BYU and independent in football, they were in the West Coast Conference in every other sport. Yep. You add them as well. So it, it, this is going to be a huge shift for the Big 12 in the sense that, you know, the Big 12's kind of spreading out. I see the reason why they added Cincinnati. You give West Virginia a more of a regional team to play. Yeah. You add BYU which is kind it's kind it of an outlier. It helps your marketing out west, but yes. other than that, there is no reason to add them other than just the name notoriety. You add Houston, that way you have a foothold in the fourth largest market in the country. Which they've been trying not trying to get, but they've been desperately needing since A and M left. Right. And then you add Central Florida, which in terms of just their overall success on the field across and on the court lately that was a good grab mm-hmm. for the Big 12. So there's that. It'll be a 14 14 team conference this next year. And, and then, then once OU and Texas leave, they'll finally be back. Finally be the Big 12. Their name will actually make sense. Right. They'll have the right number of teams correspondent to the name of the conference. That's right. <sighs> and so with that ripple effect, <laughs> yeah. Here's the next ripple effect. Mm-hmm. The American loses 3 schools. They they double what they lose, <laughs> yeah. adding six programs from Conference USA: the Charlotte 49ers, the Florida Atlantic Owls, who are coming off of a Final Four appearance. Yep. UAB, who performed very well in the NIT in basketball. North Texas, who won the NIT. Mm-hmm. You add Rice and the University of Texas at San Antonio. Yep. It is. Insane they were able to grab that much from Conference USA. I get why. Because they all had the notoriety and they were just trying to find a way to do it. And if you're going to go to one, you may as well go to the best group of five conference there is in America. And it's also the same... It's also the same recruiting base, the same marketing base, the same travel distance, basically. It's all the same region between American the American Athletic... In conference, you'd say it's literally the same exact area. When you look at who is going to be remaining in Conference USA, yeah. or, I mean, sorry, in the in the American when yeah. these six teams join, yeah, you they join East Carolina, mm-hmm. former Conference USA program. Yep, Memphis, former Conference USA program. I think there's a theme. Yeah, <laughs> SMU, former Conference USA. <laughs> yeah. Tem- I don't think Temple was in Conference USA. No, Tulane. Conference USA, mm-hmm. Tulsa, Conference USA. <laughs> the Americans, the new Conference <laughs> USA. <laughs> the only ones that aren't, that were right. never members of Conference USA, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think South Florida ever was. I don't think They so. were Big East for the longest time. Yes. And Wichita State was Missouri Valley. Mm-hmm. 
and Temple had bounced around from the Big East to the A10 yeah. and stuff like that. So they, they, they've basically taken the Conference USA of old, merging it with the new, and we're calling it the American. Right. So, because you look at who's leaving the American, UCF, former Conference USA, and Houston, former Conference USA. So, And then Cincinnati as well. Cincinnati was Big East. American. Well, yeah, they were American, but they were never in Conference USA. Oh, well, yeah. That, that was my point. Yeah. So that's an interesting dynamic to think about. So those six schools leave. It's going to boost the American big time, especially on, really on the football level and on the basketball level as yeah. well, after you saw what those schools, a lot of those schools that I mentioned did in basketball right. this last year. Right. It's a boost for them in baseball, too. Look at UTSA and Rice. Yeah. It's, so, it's, a, it's the heritage is a boost. Mm-hmm. Yes. So. And so what does Conference USA do? At one point, Conference USA was down to five schools. And at one point, there was conversations of Conference USA not existing. Right. So they were like, uh, what do we got to do? Yeah. So the ripple effects continue. They are adding Liberty, who is definitely turned to tide on an athletic level across the board. Especially football, they have been a sneaky good team for mm-hmm. the last six years. You add New Mexico State, who is an independent in football at the FBS level, but whack member. Yeah. You add Jacksonville State, and then, of course, Sam Houston. Mm-hmm. You add those four schools. They also add Dallas Baptist this year as a baseball-only member. Right. So they will have 10 in baseball, 9 for the rest. This is going to be probably an intriguing year, kind of a rebuilding year for Conference USA, a, a conference that's seen so much success mm-hmm. over so many years with the amount of talents that any programs that I just mentioned that right. have come through that conference. There's even other ones that I didn't even mention that have gone through that conference. Right. Their list of former members is very long. I'll say and even a couple names that you didn't mention that are leaving, Old Dominion and Southern Miss. They're, they're leaving Conference USA as well. They had already left. Now, oh, well, here it says they're leaving, but that, <laughs> no, 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 they, they, and then, Old Dominion yeah. and Southern Miss left last season. Oh, that's season right. Marshall the also left. And Marshall too, yeah. for the Sun Belt. Yeah. Those were three other programs that were key to Conference USA success. <laughs> Especially Marshall. You, you look at what Marshall's done since they moved yeah. up from the FCS to the FBS. I mean, Southern Miss, they just got to the regionals. Re- they hosted. Got, got to, hosted and got to a super. Yeah. So there, there's that as well. So like I said, this is going to be a retooling year for Conference USA to see, can we take teams that have had so much success elsewhere, like that of Liberty, Sam Houston at the FCS level, Jacksonville State at the FCS level. People forget Jacksonville State is a, a pillar in, mm-hmm. in, in the FCS consistently, uh, besides the last couple of years, making the playoffs. Right. And being competitive as well. Right. You take a New Mexico State program in football that historically has not been great. Mm-hmm. But they've been struggling because they've had to play as independents lately. Now they get to be a part of a conference again and see what they can do there. And, of course, that happening after the WAC folded their football program 11 years ago, and right. which I'll get to here in a second. Um, so I'm excited to see what's going to happen for Conference USA. There's a lot of hype. Mm-hmm. going into this, and it's big, especially for Sam Houston, because you get to play two of the schools, excuse me, three of the schools in the next two years that I just mentioned that are moving to the Big 12. You play right. BYU and U of H coming up this year, and then you go to UCF in 2024. Yep. It's going to be not only a boost for all the schools that are be, that are going to be moving, everyone that we just mentioned there at the FBS level, it's a huge boost, but it's going to be... Is it going to be a difficult transition? I think it will be, because yeah. I think it's been that case for almost every FBS program that has moved up in the last 16 years, save Appalachian State. Right. Right. It's going to be a tough one for Jacksonville State, I think, because, you know, the, the, from such a small college town and you're now going to be playing the highest level of football, I think that's big. The same thing applies to Sam Houston. Out of the ones that are jumping from FCS to FBS, I feel like Jacksonville State may be the most underprepared. Like, they, they, they know what they're getting into, but they don't know what they're getting into. They, they were the program that whenever it was announced who Conference USA was adding, and I kind of, you know, had to do a double yeah. take. And I was like, really? Yeah. Like, I know Conference USA needed help, because you need to have six to be a conference, mm-hmm. and you needed eight to be FBS ready. Right. 
So they needed it. And you're, of course, lest we forget, you're adding another FCS program in Kennesaw State next, next year. year. Yep. And the Bearcats actually play them this year right. uh, as a game that was added in later on in the year. To give them 12 games. Yeah. To, so a non-conference opponent. So that'll be intriguing to see. And now... Just to briefly touch on some, it's not just FBS moves that have happened. There's a lot of been big FCS moves that right. have happened. The WAC and the A Sun yep. are going to merge <sighs> to form the United Athletic Conference with Oliver Luck at the helm. Is that just for football or is that all it's sports? Just for football. That's what I thought. It yeah. is just for football. So, so, in other words, the WAC A Sun challenge they thought was a grand success. <laughs> so, they decide to. Do it again, and but we're basically gonna... create a new XFL for all of them. <laughs> we're just gonna—they're just creating a new FCS conference, is what it is. Basically, that's football only. It's football, football only. only. Football only. It is football only because <laughs> Whack and the A Sun, as individual entities with the members they have, they can exist. Yes, football they cannot. No, nope. so not all the schools they have in their in their program in, in their conferences have football. Right, especially the WAC. Mm-hmm. So the teams that will compete in the United Athletic Conference, Abilene Christian, Austin P, go P, Central Arkansas. That's the chant that they do. Austin P, go P. Is it really? Yes. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I'm going to YouTube this later. Yeah. I... <laughs> God. It's not, Jordan. Come on. I was about to say. Come on. I can't believe you fell for that for half a second. It's Moving on. <laughs> The return of Southland legend Central Arkansas. <laughs> Glad we don't have to make that trip anymore. Sugar Bears. Uh, uh, yeah. <sighs> as as a guy that did Bearcat volleyball for two <laughs> years on student radio, and it was always great playing Central Arkansas. They they kind of beat us every now mo most of the time, but yeah. just to say Sugar Bears, it's it's great. Yeah. So, ACU, Austin P, Central Arkansas, Eastern Kentucky, North Alabama, mm -hmm. Southern Utah. Yeah. Stephen F. Um, <laughs> Probably not for long, but Stephen F. We'll see. <laughs> Tarleton and then Utah Tech. Those are the ones right now. Mm -hmm. UTRGV is adding football. Right. It was originally going to be 2024, but they've had to push that back. They will join in 2025 as a football member. So, yeah. uh. you, it, it is a Whack and A-Sun merger, but if you look at this from like three years ago, and there's right. one, two three schools that were in the Southland three years ago. Man, that what a shift. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just a tiny bit. Just a tiny just bit. A little bit. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's weird, right? Because you look at, especially in FCS football, you look at the landscape, right? And you look at even some of the schools that were going to join the WAC. Incarnate Word and Lamar, at then at the very last second decided, actually, we want to go back. Well, it was... UIW wanting to join Lamar, whether they were going to stay or not. Maybe. Right. Because people forget Lamar was a WAC member for one year. For one year. For one year. Then they realized, oh. <laughs> so. So, yeah. And, and the, the other one. And they that go was, back the, to the, the South. Other, the other one that was rumored was McNeese was going to come over to the WAC. Yeah. And I think that's the, still something to watch. And, well. For later years. Yeah. Right? For, for later years, the only reason they stayed is because the Southland threw everything but the kitchen sink at them. I thought that was Southeastern Louisiana that they did that for. No, McNeese, McNeese got to host mm. everything. I thought this Kitchen last Sink year. was at was in Hammond, not no. Got it, got it, no. got it. So I'm intrigued to see how the UAC is going to work out mm -hmm. because you, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of good programs mm -hmm. in there. As much as it pains me to say it, <laughs> Stephen F. Austin's kind of turning the football program around. Oh, they have been. They have been, especially look, the last look, few just years. Just look at the last three Piney Woods. Right. They should have beat us two out of those three, absolutely. No, I think they if not all three. I think all three. <laughs> and Especially the last two. You and I have broadcasted all three of them. All those. three of them. <laughs> <laughs> you had Student Radio 19. You had Student Radio 21. 21. And then I had K-Sam in last year. Yep. We should have lost those last two. <laughs> But uh, because of because uh, of Des Jackson last year, mm -hmm. and because of uh, Trapper Panel the year before that, man, we we, we and the leg of Seth Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, it was Seth Morgan in twenty one, right? Or twenty one, yeah. yeah. In twenty two was Pavan, yeah. But either way, 
SFA, point SFA started to turn their program around. Yes. Tarleton's on the up and coming. Yeah. Um, As a newer Division One program. Right. And you look at the A-Sun, you know, Central Arc's always kind of been pesky. And the A-Sun, I'm... <sighs> I don't know. I feel like they're they're definitely going to fall off. Yeah. Because you're losing Jacksonville State. You're losing Kennesaw State next year, and you're losing Liberty. Those are your head honchos of the conference. Well, remember, Liberty was FBS. Yeah, but point being... Across the board, Across the losing. board, you're losing basically your three head honchos. Yes. Austin P and Central Arkansas basically become your top two teams in the conference. Well, and I would argue Eastern Kentucky's on the up-and-coming, too, because they... I mean, yeah. They, 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 let's be honest, they... Almost beat us. Right. So, intriguing to see there. Other touches on the FCS, the Colonial Athletic Association, they're still rebuilding now after they lost James Madison a couple of years ago. They add North Carolina e t Last year, they're now starting their football in the CAA mm-hmm. this season. They are also adding Campbell from the Big South. Yeah. So, that ripple effect has also forced another merger to come about between the Big South and the Ohio Valley. Because both of those programs cannot survive with just the football members that they have. The Tell big me se- it's called the Big Valley. I, I would hope. <laughs> but they, they don't have a name for it yet. <laughs> Come on. There's only two programs in the Big South right now that play football. <sighs> Charleston Southern and Eastern Hill. And, and Gardner-Webb. That's it. <laughs> the rest come from the Ohio Valley. Eastern Illinois, Lindenwood, which is a transitioning program. SEMO, Tennessee State, Tennessee Tech. UT Martin, and they're about to lose. We- and they're about to add Western Illinois. They're going to pl- Western Illinois is going to leave the Summit League. They're going to play in the Missouri Valley right. this year. They'll join the OVC Big South, whatever they're going to call it, mm-hmm. in 2024. And then the last touch here, it's uh, just a minor footnote, but I actually learned it today. I had no idea this happened. Saint, well, I knew this. Saint Francis Brooklyn is going to be dissolving their athletic program. Yes, and so the Northeast Conference responded. And they have added Lemoyne University from Division Two. I don't know. I, I, I don't know who they are. Who? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, just a tiny footnote. Yeah, on I guess that. just so, may as well. So, yeah, need to do something. Yeah. So that's what's going to be happening this Saturday. Is all those moves are going to go into effect, and it's about this is going to change the dynamic of. Uh, of not of the football this of excuse me let me get my words out properly <laughs> this is going to change the dynamic of the NCAA this year even before we even get to the big move yeah. for OU and UT next year I think I I can't say yet whether or not it's going to have a positive or negative impact college athletics wide because obviously there's all the rumors of eventually. The Big Ten, the SEC, and, uh, and whatever other Power Fives decide to do it, or maybe just all of them in general, are all going to break off and create their own basically college athletic group, right? Mm-hmm. So I I can't say yet whether all of this reshuffling of the entire face of college athletics is a positive or negative yet. It's just a lot of change. It, it, and I think a lot of people are going to have to give it a little time for most of these programs to kind of get used to everything, especially some of the smaller programs, some of the mid-majors that are changing, uh, and for teams like Sam Houston, for Jacksonville State, schools at that level that are making the jump football-wise and are going to a conference like Conference USA or the ones moving to the American. It's going to take a little bit of time and adjustment. And And that's why I tell people whenever they ask me, I was like, what do you think about this move? And I was like, to me, and I know this sounds like a dumb answer, only time is going to tell mm-hmm. whether it, this is going to pay off in the in the grand scheme of things. Right. Do I think this is going to pay off for Sam Houston on several levels? Yes, it will. Mm-hmm. This is going to boost this uni- the university as a whole because it puts a bigger spotlight on Huntsville, Texas, that a, ta- a town that is already growing at an alarming rate. That and you get more of a foothold. At least you get closer to that foothold. Of the city of Houston now when right. it comes to recruits and everything else. Because kids that can't, let's say they can't get into the A&Ms, right. the UTs, the Texas Techs, they got a school, for, for the, at least the kiddos in Houston, they got a school 70 miles away that they're playing the highest level of football at. And that's the thing. about It's basically a 50-50 split if you look at it. People who go to Sam are either from Houston or Dallas. Or Dallas. That's the majority of the campus. 
and and that, and that's the big advantage of being on Interstate 45. Right. Is you're basically you're not the halfway point between Houston and Dallas, but no. when you look at things athletic wise, between here in Huntsville and Dallas, there's no big colleges outside no. of maybe Tarleton. But and then between here and Houston, outside of U of H and Rice, where else are you going to go? The only so, other one is going to A and M. Is going to or A&M going to JUCO and Blinn or San Jack. Right. So I think this is going to boost Sam Houston big time in terms of recruitment financially. Mm-hmm. Thank God. We Eight hundred thousand a year for we, Sam Houston and all the other CUSA schools, right? And because of the and, new and TV on, deal, on, and on September second, you're getting a fat check from BYU, BYU at one point two million dollars. You're getting eight hundred thousand from UCF next year. I don't mm-hmm. know how much we're getting from U of H. I don't think it's anything to that length, but yeah. still. it's probably going to be about the same, or maybe a little less because you're not traveling. But right. probably somewhere around a million. I would think from U of H because it is still a Big Twelve, right? So, so, it, 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 like like we said, time's going to tell whether mm-hmm. this is going to pay off in the long run. Not just for Sam Houston, but I think really across the board for all these moves right. that these conferences and programs are making, it's going to look very different. But because this is the biggest realignment shift since A and M left for the SEC, right? And we there wasn't. I, I'd have to go back and look and see how many other alignments were made whenever they left, along with Nebraska leaving for the Big Ten, Arkansas going to the SEC, mm-hmm. whatever. So this is the biggest shift that we've seen, yeah. and it's worked out for a lot of those schools. Right. Nebraska, eh, yeah. but but for A and M and for Arkansas, it's been big moves for them. I just to say the least, folks. I'm excited. Right. To see what's going to happen, especially for the Bearcats coming up here once we make the shift on Saturday. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a lot of excitement uh, in the beginning, um, but you know, like we said, it's going to take a little time for all this to kind of and have the clouds kind of clear and the fog kind of clear and see what the damage is, what the positive is, and what things are going to look like moving forward. And folks, a big key to the Bearcats being successful is you guys showing up. There's going to be a lot of opportunities to watch Bearcat football, especially in the evening time when it's not (laughs) hot outside in the middle of a Saturday afternoon in Southeast Texas. You're going to have some Wednesday and Thursday night games to come out and check out. And even if you can't, if you, if you have relatives that can't make it, you're gonna be. We're gonna be on the national stage, folks. Right. There's. There's. We have a game on ESPN two. We have multiple games on the CBS Sports Network, which a lot of cable providers and other streaming services offer. The first game of the season in BYU is on FS one. It's on FS one, which is so. one tick below Fox. <laughs> so yeah, you're gonna have several opportunities to watch the Bearcats on the national stage, and a big key to that is coming on out to Bauer Stadium yeah. and watching them play, and then coming out to Johnson Coliseum because I know they haven't released any TV schedules yet, but I'm sure basketball is gonna get some games on I'm national sure. TV. Baseball may even get a couple oh, yeah. on ESPN. I think athletics wide, you're gonna see it. You're gonna see a lot. So yeah. this is gonna be. A great new era for Sam Houston, and on on behalf of Jordan, I'm sure we're all very excited and glad that we get to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be fun to see. What are we doing next week? So next week, we are going to do a preview of the MLB draft. That's coming up next weekend, Uh, not this week. So we'll wait for that a little bit, kind of seeing. Paul Skeens, Paul (laughs) Skeens, Paul (laughs) Skeens. Number one pick, take it to the bank. We'll talk about it next week. We'll talk about it next week, and then also – We can finally start getting into the NFL once again. Middle of July is the deadline for the franchise tag. So we'll start looking at who might, who might not, who, what's, how's that going to shape out free agency? What's going to change with that, with the franchise tag? And who makes a late splash before many camps and stuff get started in late July? So that will do it for our show here this week on the KSAN Sports Podcast. And ladies and gentlemen, we're just a little under two hours. Let's go. <laughs> we finally did it on time. <laughs> Third time's a charm, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it's all good. It's all good. But yeah, so that's our show here for this week. Again, I'm at Jordan Smith. That is Carlos Zimmerman. We will see you all next week for another edition of the KSAM Sports Podcast. See you later, folks.